Now, the paper, just like all the paper ones from 2016 onwards, is divided into 10 questions, and those 10 questions give us 91 marks. It's worthwhile printing the paper off and having to go yourself first. Uh, have a look through the different questions and see which ones uh, you might be a bit stronger with. It might be the describe or explain questions, the AO1 style, and that might then give you a little bit more time for the AO2, which is really the data interpretation and the application of your knowledge to unfamiliar scenarios that we'll see today, and also the AO3, which are the evaluation style questions. So moving on to question one then, uh, this question is about mitosis. So we need to make sure we're gonna talk about mitosis and not meiosis here. So we're gonna annotate a little bit of the question. And then it says the scientists stained and photographed the chromosomes, uh, and that is in figure one on the left. And then in figure two on the right hand side, the scientist has then rearranged the images from figure one uh, to put them into uh, homologous pairs in descending order from the biggest chromosome, which is chromosome one, down to the smallest chromosomes, which is actually the two chromosome 22s. And then you've got X and Y, which are the sex chromosomes. So the question is saying, give two pieces of evidence from figure one on the left hand side that this cell was undergoing mitosis. And then it says explain your answers so we can see it's worth two marks so each mark point will involve one feature or one piece of evidence from the figure one on the left and also the second half of your sentence explaining why that feature indicates that the cells are going mitosis so that's the two bits to each mark point here piece of evidence and then explain that evidence as to say why it's undergoing mitosis so if you look at the figure one on the left, we can see each of the chromosomes is a replicated chromosome. That means it's made of two identical molecules of DNA. Now we call those identical molecules of DNA sister chromatids. So each chromosome is a replicated chromosome made of two identical sister chromatids, which are joined at the centromere. Now we know DNA replication occurs before mitosis and that's in interphase. But the DNA in interphase would be arranged as chromatin, so you would not be able to see these replicated chromosomes. Now, the start of mitosis is prophase, and in prophase, the chromatin supercoils. And that means that the sister chromatids that make up each chromosome become shorter and thicker, and therefore the chromosomes become visible under an optical microscope with correct staining. So the two pieces of evidence then that we need to have a look at the mark scheme answers. So we're going to have the feature and then explain the feature. The individual chromosomes are visible. That's the feature that we can see because they have condensed or they've supercoiled or the chromatin has become shorter and thicker. The second mark point, each chromosome is made up of two identical sister chromatids. That's the feature joined at the centromere. And the explanation is because the DNA had replicated before the start of mitosis. And that would have been in S phase of interphase. Mark point number three, the chromosomes are not arranged in homologous pairs, which they would be if it was meiosis. So on the left hand side on figure one, we can see chromosome one, which is replicated, is not matched up in a bivalent with the second chromosome one. So the maternal and the paternal chromosomes are not linked together through uh, synapsis. They remain independent of each other. They haven't formed a bivalent. So that indicates it's mitosis and not uh, meiosis. Now, if you have a look on the right hand side, these are alternative kind of mark points. And it also tells us what's not accepted. So it says, except tightly coiled or short and thick for condensed, well, that's okay, but do not accept contracted. So if you put the chromosomes are visible because they are contracted, that would not be credit worthy. Uh, they say, except two sister chromatids or identical sister chromatids for two chromatids. That's mark point number two. And they also accept not meiosis because bivalence or crossing over is not seen in the image. So bivalence and crossing over at the chiasmata point would be meiosis and not mitosis.
Okay, so the next question asks us to uh, name the stage of mitosis that was shown in figure one. Well, we know it's mitosis, so we can get rid of interphase straight away because interphase happens prior to mitosis, which is made up of G1, S and G2. So we can get rid of the second box. Uh, anaphase, we know it can't be because we can see two sister chromatids joined at the centromere. In anaphase, the sister chromatids would be pulled to the poles of the cell in a V shape as the centromere splits. Uh, telophase, we would see two nuclei that would be reforming, so we can't be telophase, and that leaves us with prophase, which we know it is. So we'll give that a quick tick. Then it says in question 1.3, when preparing the cells for observation, the scientist placed uh, the cells in a solution that had a slightly higher or less negative water potential than the cytoplasm. So it's saying that the solution they used to place the cells in had a water potential that was, for example, minus 100 kilopascals, where the cytoplasm would have had a more negative water potential of maybe minus 400 kilopascals. So less negative is the same as slightly higher when we're talking about water potential. This did not cause the cells to burst, but moved the chromosomes further apart in order to reduce the overlapping of the chromosomes when observed with an optical microscope. Suggest how this procedure moved the chromosomes apart. So in prophase, it's nothing to do with the mitotic spindle here. Uh, what's actually happened is as water's entered the cell, it's caused the volume of the cytoplasm to increase or expand or to swell. And therefore that's gonna slightly move the chromosomes apart so we can actually see each individual chromosome and they're not kind of tangled up together. And we know it's about water potential, so we're going to reference osmosis uh, down a water potential gradient. So let's have a quick look at the marks here then. So water moves into the cells, or we could say water moves into the cytoplasm of the cells by osmosis, that keyword there underlined. And therefore, the cytoplasm of the cell gets bigger. Mark point number two on the left. So there's our two mark points. Um, on the right hand side, we've got the reject at the top. It says reject water moving into the chromosomes of the nucleus. Please bear in mind that in prophase, the nucleus actually is disintegrated and, and disappeared. So there wouldn't actually be a nucleus there. Number two, it says accept the idea of the cell cytoplasm having a greater volume. So the volume increases or the cytoplasm swells and expands like we mentioned. It does say to ignore references to pressure changes or turgidity, so we're going to stay away from that. And then it says at the bottom there in red, ignore references to changing water or fluid contents of the cell. So it's really about the volume of water increasing the cytoplasm, causing that to swell, and therefore the sister chromatids kind of get teased apart, moved apart slightly. So question 1.4 says the dark stain used on the chromosomes binds more to some areas of the chromosome than others, giving the chromosomes a characteristic striped or banded appearance. Uh, suggests one way the structure of the chromosome could differ along its length to result in the stain binding more in some areas. So we have to remember a chromosome, even though these are replicated chromosomes, which are made of two identical molecules of DNA joined at the centromere, two sister chromatids joined at the centromere. Um, each molecule of DNA will have a specific base sequence and the sister chromatid will be identical to that. So we might have different base sequences along the length of the molecule of DNA to which the stain can actually bind more. It could also be that the DNA wrapped around histones might be more supercoiled in certain areas of the chromosome and therefore the dye might bind more to that. Or it could even be that in some areas along the length of that chromosome or that molecule of DNA, there's more genes. And if there's more genes, maybe the dye can bind to those areas uh, a bit more tightly, giving it a darker appearance. So the key is to remember that a chromosome is essentially a molecule of DNA with a base sequence from start to end. Obviously it's double-stranded and it will have different genes along its length. And each gene codes for a polypeptide chain.
So they accepted differences in base sequences at the top for one mark. They accepted differences in histones or interaction of the DNA with the histones because the DNA might be more supercoiled around the histone proteins in certain areas of the chromosome. Or it could be differences in condensation or supercoiling was accepted on its own. Now, if you have a look at the right hand side, it does tell us the answer must be in context of differences in the arrangement of the chromosome, not just anything related to the properties of the stain. So they're looking for features of the chromosome itself. Uh, in year 13, you guys will study uh, methylation of DNA. So it might be that some of the DNA is more methylated on some of the bases along the length of the DNA, and that might allow the, the stain to bind more. It could be that there's more or less acetyl groups on the histones, which might allow the dye to bind more or less, but you will do that towards the end of year 13. So that's why it was also accepted. And then obviously they did accept there at the bottom, accept different genes along the length, but reject the idea of different alleles. So just bear in mind one gene on one chromosome or one piece or molecule of DNA will be one allele, one variant of that gene. So you would not get different alleles of that gene along the length of the chromosome. You get one allele for that gene on that piece of DNA. Question 1.5 says, in figure two, the chromosomes are arranged in homologous pairs. So this is where they've taken the photograph and they put chromosome one, which is replicated next to chromosome two, which is replicated. Um, so it looks a bit like a bivalent, but they've actually just uh, rearranged that so we can see each maternal and paternal chromosome uh, as a pair. So this is an A01 question. So what is a homologous pair of chromosomes? The better Marxian answer for me is that two chromosomes, which are the same size, the two chromosomes will have the same genes along their length. And these genes will be located at the same positions or the same loci. So their marks from answer from 2018 was uh, two chromosomes that carry the same genes. And that was worth one mark. But if you get a two or three marker for homologous pairs, always say two molecules of DNA. Or it could be two, two chromosomes which are replicated. Same size, same genes at the same loci. Now, just bear in mind on the right hand side, it does say to reject the same alleles. OK, because two different chromosomes, homologous chromosomes, can actually have different variants of a gene, so different alleles. So on chromosome one, you might have one allele, like a dominant allele. And then chromosome two, the homologous chromosome, you might have a recessive allele. So that's why it said reject the same alleles. Okay, question 1.6 then tells us to give two ways in which the arrangement of prokaryotic DNA, so bacteria are examples of prokaryotic cells, and how that DNA is different from the arrangement of the human DNA that we saw in figure one, which is the eukaryotic DNA. Now, this is why it's really important to circle key, key terms in the question, because this is not about the structure of the DNA, which would obviously be double-stranded in both. And we might talk about introns and exons. This is about the arrangement of the DNA. So the Marxian answer then is prokaryotic DNA is circular, whereas or but eukaryotic DNA in the human cells that we can see is linear. Now it does tell us to use figure one and what we can see in figure one. So we really have to focus in on what we can actually see in figure one in order to use that information. Now, we also know that prokaryotic DNA is not bound or associated with histone proteins. So there's no chromatin there uh, and there's no super condensing of the DNA. Whereas we can see that in figure one where the chromosomes are visible. Uh, number three, there's only one molecule or one piece of DNA in the prokaryotic cell. Certainly the main chromosome, circular chromosome piece of DNA, which is in the nucleoid. Whereas in figure one, there's actually lots of molecules of DNA and there would be 46 chromosomes in figure one because it's a human cell. They also accepted in a prokaryotic uh, cell, the DNA can also be found as plasmids. 
which are smaller circular pieces of DNA, which you do not find in human cells and are not visible in figure one. So on the right hand side, then it says a maximum of one mark if you'd said prokaryotic DNA is only found as plasmids or if prokaryotic DNA is single stranded, which we know it isn't. It is double stranded, just like eukaryotic DNA. It says ignore references to the nucleus, exons, introns or the length of the DNA. So that's another type of question that might ask you for the differences between prokaryotic DNA and eukaryotic DNA rather than the arrangement of that DNA in the cell. And then it said do not credit the converse statements. So it's really asking you to talk about the prokaryotic DNA arrangement and how that is different to what we can see in figure one that we're given.